when we're talking about defining these standards, so it's not just the AAP, it's also what's called evidence-based standards, evidence-based medicine. You go to any pediatrician, any doctor, and they say, well, it's evidence-based. Well, what does that mean? It's kind of a, it's, it's kind of a euphemistic phrase that I used to overlook, but evidence-based means that there's been a certain kind of study that has been done on any procedure or any drug, any, any pharmaceutical that, that demonstrates with a control, against a control group that the substance, the drug, or the procedure actually benefits more than something else, more than the absence of that pharmaceutical or procedure does. And if there is not an evidence-based study then a doctor won't acknowledge that or won't ever won't ever recommend anything. Um, they have to adhere to this evidence-based standard. The problem with this evidence-based standard is, well, there's a couple problems with it. First of all, these studies are enormous and they're enormously expensive. So the only people that have the money really to pay for these studies are the government or the big pharmaceutical companies. Big pharmaceutical companies are, of course, motivated by profit. They're motivated by the fact that they want their product, which they're testing against a control group, to be shown to be effective. Therefore, if it's shown to be effective, then they add it to the standard of care for whatever whatever um, healthcare issue we're talking about. And then doctors, you have to, according to the standard of care, prescribe that particular drug for that particular ailment. And so pharmaceutical companies who stand to profit pay for studies to be done about their own their own drugs. Now this of course leaves all alternative type healthcare that where there's not a lot of profit. I mean there's not a lot of profit in the supplements, the natural herbs and supplements that you can get at any health food store. There's not the profit in those in those things that there is in a drug company's pharmaceutical product. And so alternative stuff in an evidence-based system is overlooked because there are no studies that prove the efficacy of this product. And if there's not a study that proves the efficacy of the product, then evidence-based practitioners won't touch it. So this is from the get-go, in my opinion, a disservice to the patient because it's ignoring a tremendous amount uh, of, of things, of tools that we should have in our tool belt to help us with our problems. The second problem with the evidence-based model is that oftentimes, oftentimes even drugs that have undergone certain studies haven't been studied directly for certain groups where they're recommended. And what I'm talking about in this case is I'm talking about the flu vaccine for pregnant women. The, The flu vaccine is recommended for pregnant women, but did you know there's never been a study that actually studied the flu vaccine in pregnant women? It's shocking, right? When when I when I was pregnant with my daughter, and I you know was obviously going for uh, prenatal care, and they recommended the flu vaccine, and I said, okay, well, can you show me the studies that show that this is safe? They 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 couldn't, they couldn't. And I looked it up myself, and there wasn't any studies, and that's that's true with a lot of with a lot of things. So it, it's a little bit of a contradiction. You'll see that there when you have natural supplements or herbs that haven't been studied or haven't had these 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 evidence-based studies done on them, the medical field won't touch them. But when you have a pharmaceutical that has been tested just for efficacy, but not for safety in certain groups where it's recommended, they still are okay violating the evidence-based model there. So there's a, there's a, a contradiction there that points to a profit motive, which isn't necessarily in and of itself nefarious. It isn't necessarily evil, but it is it is a red flag. And then the third problem with the evidence-based model is that oftentimes these studies can be rigged. And there's a couple of examples of this. I mean, we saw this with COVID. We saw it with the hydroxychloroquine studies. We saw it with the ivermectin studies, where the way that the study was conducted, the way that it was structured and written it was structured and written to beget a certain outcome. So hydroxychloroquine, obviously there's only efficacy if you use it in the very early onset of the disease, but the studies were structured not to administer it until five or six days into the virus, at which point we already knew that it wasn't effective. Yet the result of that study was hydroxychloroquine is not effective against COVID-19. Well, that doesn't tell the whole story. The study was structured to beget that outcome instead of structured to actually test the efficacy. Same thing happened with ivermectin. The same thing happened actually with the Gardasil vaccine. So the Gardasil vaccine, the control group wasn't actually a real control group. The control group, which was supposed to get just get, or purported, I should say, to get saline, the way they the way that they presented it made it seem like the control room just got a saline injection. It actually wasn't just saline. It had aluminum in it, the adjuvant that is, I mean, it's a toxic adjuvant, right? And these are called focebos instead of placebos. And so some of the reactions that the girls experienced during this initial trial of Gardasil 
um, were mirrored in the control group, but it was because it was because it wasn't a true placebo that it had the saline had aluminum um, in it as well. This is actually also true for co-sleeping studies. So we're all told, like if you have your baby in your bed, it it increases their risk of suffocation. It increases their risk that you're going to roll on them. Um, this is this is a dangerous practice. We're told, and they say studies show this. But if you actually analyze the studies that purport to show this, you'll find that they don't they don't define co-sleeping in a sensible way. They include in their co-sleeping group, they include people who are drunk. They include mothers who are under the influence of drugs. They include couch sleeping in this group of co-sleeping versus mothers like me who sleep without any extra blankets, without any extra pillows on a, on a firm mattress with it, with the um, sheet pulled taut. I mean, in a, in a very safe in a very safe manner. And so they lump all of these dangerous behaviors in with co-sleeping in order to beget the result that they want. The result being they they want to they want to discourage people from co-sleeping. Now, why they want to discourage people from co-sleeping, that's a topic for a different day. That's a more philosophical topic here. The point of all of this is these studies, even when there are evidence-based studies, they are oftentimes constructed in a way that doesn't tell the whole story. 